Welcome to Future of Good Live. My name is Vinod Rajasekharan, and I am CEO and Editor-in-Chief at Future of Good and your host today. Before we dive into the discussion, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from unceded, unsurrendered, and occupied Algonquin Anishinaabe territory in what is colonially known as Ottawa. And it's important for me personally uh, to acknowledge the privileges I have, and there are many, um, as an immigrant, as a settler to this, to this land. Future of Good is a media and learning organization with a mission to enable a smarter social purpose world, to equip change makers like you with essential insights, analysis, and knowledge so you can make a bigger difference at work and in the causes you care about. And our journalists report on news, solutions, and trends shaping the social purpose world on areas where transformative change is happening. Areas like data and technology, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism, social finance and impact investing, philanthropy and giving, volunteerism, the nonprofit workforce. And now we're hiring a full-time journalist to cover all things humanitarian aid and global development. So please spread the word. We are a member-enabled organization, and there are more than 2,200 individuals and organizations part of our member community, from nonprofits and charities to social impact teams at, at big companies to philanthropic organizations and grant makers to you know, frontline social service agencies, government departments at various levels, think tanks, associations, and so on. Members enable our groundbreaking journalism and learning programming, such as these webinars, Social Finance Forum, the Black Leadership and Social Impact Summit, and our upcoming first ever Changemaker Wellbeing Summit, which I'm really, really looking forward to. We'll convene hundreds of teams to dive into workplace well-being in the social purpose world and explore everything from mental health to climate anxiety to financial stress to parental well-being and a whole lot more. So thank you for being a member and using Future of Good as a professional resource for learning, development, and decision-making. We have a number of change makers joining us from coast to coast to coast today. I'm sure thousands more will check out the recording on demand. I've been looking forward to today's conversation for some time, and it's with a very special guest. Tanya Sermon is one of Canada's leading social entrepreneurs, the CEO of the Center for Social Innovation, and a dear friend. Um, the Center for Social Innovation is Canada's largest social purpose co-working community. And Tanya has crafted a number of social innovations from the Constellation model to the community bond. And these have enhanced you know, the work of tens of thousands of change makers around the world. Personally, I've admired Tanya's leadership and vision for the possibilities um, of social innovation and the possibilities around innovation through collaboration, something that's really at the heart of the Center for Social Innovation. So what's today's discussion about? Well, work, work spaces, work culture, work hours, almost everything about work is undergoing a once in a generation change, an extraordinary, a profound change. And as we stand at the intersection of technology, collaboration and flexibility, Tony and I will unpack some of the, the really extraordinary shifts shaping and reshaping the future of work. Some folks have said that it feels like it's the hardest time to lead in the history of work. So today we'll dive into some of the innovations and strategies redefining conventional workspaces. And there are a number of these, from online collaboration tools to the psychology of remote team dynamics. Tony and I will aim to uncover some of the elements that make the new era of work. And Tony is going to draw from about 20 years of leading co-working and social innovation and will share insights on fostering a culture of inclusion, productivity, employee engagement, and work-life balance. And our intention for you as a leader is to discover how teams adapt and thrive in this dynamic era and hopefully take away some uh, actionable insights to enhance your team's work experience. So let's dive in. Welcome, Tanya. So good to have you on Future of Good Live. Um, Hi, Vinod. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. I'll jump straight into perhaps the toughest call that you've had to make recently. And it could not have been easy. And we've been following it from a distance. Of course, Future of Good covered the story, but I'd like you to tell us about it. And in particular, there must be so much that you were grappling with, tensions that you were holding and wrestling with. 
tell us what was going through your mind and the kinds of things that you were navigating, uh, you know, internally and the debates that you've been having and, and how you feel now. Yeah. So, uh, so the big announcement that we came out with uh, in September was that uh, the Center for Social Innovation has made the decision to sell 720 Bathurst Street. So just to give people a little bit of a uh, a, a framework uh, and just to give you a little bit of like what's happened since the pandemic. So, um, you know, CSI is a nonprofit social enterprise. I think most people know that. Uh, in 2019, we were operating uh, a, a fully functioning uh, 720 Bathurst CSI Annex, uh, fully functioning operating CSI Spadina. We were operating uh, CSI New York, a 22,000 square foot space in Chelsea, Manhattan, and a 10,000 square foot space in partnership with Artscape in Regent Park. Uh, we also uh, were operating our both our nonprofit, the Center for Social Innovation, and our charity, uh, Social Innovation Canada, um, so at, which was home for all of our climate ventures work. Um, and, and it's a little known fact that we also operate and support TechSoup Canada. So what, what I personally was looking at um, uh, when the pandemic hit in March 2020, we were a 80 person operation uh, operating four brands. Uh, national brand, two national brands, one acceleration brand, and then our local brand with CSI that owned the real estate, uh, and and operating in New York as well. So um, when the when the pandemic hit, the first thing that went was CSI New York. Uh, by November 2020, we were forced to close down uh, our New York operation. It was already pretty vulnerable, uh, but that was the first hit. In March 21. Uh, when things were not letting up, uh, we were forced to give notice to Artscape and we uh, transformed our co-working space in Regent Park from a co-working to a community living room, which um, we were able to experiment with that uh, for about a year. But then the financial pressures both on us and on Artscape um, resulted in having to close that space uh, down in 22. Mm. Uh, then... Uh, this is just like the, this is I mean, a sad story, but not it. <laughs> then we made a, we looked at, I was looking at the financial picture. All right. right. And, I'm, and I'm starting to see, okay, we've cleaned house. We, you know, anything that was vulnerable, we started to shut down. Uh, no funding, no long-term funding was secured for either Social Innovation Canada or for Climate Ventures. Uh, but mm -hmm. we had strong partnerships and new leadership emerging. So a partnership with Foresight um, uh, led us to the decision to sort of restructure uh, and to really lean into the leadership for them to take that project off. And then, of course, uh, I stepped down as CEO of the charity and um, Andrea Nemtin stepped in to lead uh, the work of Social Innovation Canada. Um, but that those, those decisions were um, ultimately because there was no long-term security, no long-term financial viability, and they really needed leadership that could commit to one vision at a time. So that that happened in in uh, last year, uh, about a, about eighteen months ago. Now we we facilitated the transition, um, and that left us with looking at the real estate and TechSoup Canada. Right. TechSoup Canada. Um, uh, in 22, also, you know, who knows, pandemic related or not, um, uh, Microsoft and Google both decided to um, leave the program. Uh, so that meant huge impacts uh, from a financial perspective to what was happening with our national TechSoup Canada project. And, um, and we started to see interest rates start to rise. Right. And so I'm now looking at the the last two, right? The CSI, the two uh, buildings and uh, TechSoup, hearing what's happening with TechSoup, which has been such an important part of our financial picture. Right. And then looking at interest rates and seeing that work from home had completely altered the face of our work, completely right. altered the face of our work. So we um, we started to do a whole bunch of financial projections, uh, you know, putting in funding proposals everywhere. But, you know, the core business has never been funded uh, by anyone. So, you know, nobody's interested in subsidizing co-working. It, it just doesn't it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to happen. We've had some excellent support from 
you know, Trillium Foundation who support us with capital projects from time to time, but nothing at a systemic way. And we started to take a look at the financial future of the buildings. And let me tell you, um, between three variables that were, so basically we're looking at an additional million dollars per year of additional costs to operate CSI that have absolutely zero to do with the delivery of our service to our community. We would be looking with projected interest rates doubling for us, and that's conservative. Mm -hmm. We'd be looking at an additional $600,000 a year of interest costs, another $200,000 of increased property taxes, and another two to $300,000 in um, uh, wage increases as a result of inflation. So we're looking at a structural challenge. And I personally, you and I know, Vinod, I am so frustrated by the kinds of, when, when the economic system, this mystery magical thing that seems to control so much of what we do in the world. And, and I got really, really, um, you know, scared, frustrated. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, you know, the board and I went through a really thoughtful process to sort of say, you know, we need to do something structural. Uh, it can't just be, you know, cut costs or fundraise. It has to be a structural change. Mm-hmm. And um, and so we hired some consultants to help us think through uh, what what are the different options with the two buildings that we own and, and how do you assess um How do you assess uh, the, you know, we've got so much equity built in these two assets. What what might we be able to do? And so we began a a really fulsome review looking at, you know, what were the options? And of course, it really came down to which which of your babies do you give up? It felt like a Sophie's choice. (laughs) Um, And um, ultimately, you know, uh, 192 Spadina, so our Spadina location Mm -hmm. is twice the size of our annex location. Um, And we decided uh, that in order to support the most number of organizations and people who are doing social purpose work, um, and also because of the um, the age and condition of the building and the options of what different development paths, we we did make the difficult decision to put 720 on the market. Um, But I I gotta tell you, we couldn't have done it at a worse time. So it's, you know, uh, well, interest rates aren't only just affecting us, they're affecting absolutely everybody. Right. And so, and, you know, you'll, you're hearing it. And as, uh, you know, developers are being asked to bid on creation of housing, they're going, well, uh, you know, we don't, where do we get the capital from? The interest rates are so volatile right now. And of course, we're seeing a massive restructuring of the commercial real estate sector. So we're looking at vacancy rates of between 25 and 30 percent in in Toronto. So, you know, there's a massive, massive real estate restructuring going on Um, in some ways now is a um, not I wish I'd put it on the market a year ago, you know, Mm. Uh, would have been. um, But here we are. Uh, And the goal and the objective is to be, you know, financially resilient and to not be tied to market forces in the same way that we have been the last 20 years. There's so much to unpack there, Tanya, Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, I I, I do want to kind of get into, um, you know, something fundamental about, um, because, you know, you know, as you know, I started uh, Impact Hub uh, Ottawa uh, yeah. and um, and much smaller in scale uh, compared to what, what you folks are, are are doing. But, you know, in the, I mean, I'm home right now. It looks like you're, <laughs> you're home. home, right? Um, in the age of working from home, what, 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 what's the role of co-working spaces? Yeah. And actually that's what, that's what kept me going (laughs) because, because what we saw during the pandemic was um, some really, really uh, troubling and concerning uh, trends. So Mm -hmm. let's just, I'll just highlight a a few of them here. The the first one is that we really, we know that working from home uh, has a direct impact on mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm. Um, And when we were stuck at home, People were feeling 
stuck. They're feeling depressed. They don't have the same energy. What we really started to understand that we get something from each other at a physical pheromonal level, right? Like, you know, uh, this connection to be with each other. And so while it was amazing that we could connect via video, like, holy mackerel, that's phenomenal. That I mean, 10 years ago, that was not a, an accessible thing, but here we are doing this thing right now. So, right. And it's, it's inclusive, right? We're national, but, but we know that we get more energy uh, and so mental health was a, was a big one. We were finding people were getting depressed. They're feeling lonely. They're feeling um, disconnected. We know that there's impacts in terms of equity and career development. You know, people who are new to the field, not being able to build the kind of social connections that would allow them for their careers to develop. Right. We know that there were issues, really serious issues around productivity and performance. You know, uh, the workers never want to say that, but uh, the banks all sure know that. <laughs> so anybody trying to bring you back has said, oh, I'm watching productivity. So this is what's happening here. And then, of course, you have institutional learning and knowledge transfer, like how do people understand how culture transfers if they're not in the same spot with each other, right? Mm. So how does culture and well-being transfer? The big ones I was interested in was organizational culture and team dynamics and, of course, collaboration and organizational alignment, right? You can't right. actually, um, you know, I found for myself that I was like developing these strategic plans and like trying to work the team through it. But if it wasn't visceral, if it wasn't in the body, it's like they didn't, it's like it didn't happen, right? And so trying to get the organization to align and collaborate became really, really challenging. And so ultimately, what I think's happened with work is now we're now we're in this like, what's the right mix of work from home and work in place with each other? And how does each organization find the right combination that works for them? And this is where co-working has the winning formula, right? Co-working is the winning formula because, of course, you don't have to rent a place for, you know, uh, 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 for permanent office for just your organization all the time. But actually, co-working becomes an amazing option for the large organization who only wants to, you know, who might have 40 staff, but only seven show up on a daily basis or, they want to come in and they want to do their team meetings or they want to have lunch together or they want to be able to, you know, team table it. Um, right. And so what's been amazing is watching how co-working is actually already was already ahead of the modular approach to work so that the organization who um, doesn't want to cover the ongoing lease operations is able to pick and choose what works best for their team and retain those aspects um, that are going to be so important. And then and I'll let you talk, but to say organizational collaboration and culture building is, of course, the core of where CSI is at. Right. And, you know, there, there's, there's a really, I really love the sort of the ways that you identified um, how the pandemic has, has, has kind of you know, changed uh, how we view work and the and the office and, and, and all this stuff and, and the, some of the cascading effects that we're still te see, you know, seeing to, to, to this day. I mean, we're, we're hosting a um, our our first ever Changemaker Wellbeing Summit in March of next year. Which I'm and super excited about. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. So, uh, and, and so much of what, what you're saying is going to be explored at, uh, at that summit. But I want to go, you know, just wind the clock back a little bit, you know, about a decade or so, and really curious about how has the value proposition of co-working evolved? You know, and because th there's co-working, it, it was a, you know, um, it was a really, really neat concept. I um, want to sort of, you know, kind of go back to maybe 2000 and, you know, um, uh, four or five in that area was, was a breakthrough thing. And it became a global phenomenon in the last sort of mm -hmm. decade or so. And, you know, we can all talk about the sort of the WeWork story <laughs> and, the, and, and the rise and fall and all of that. Uh, but even if you just look at it from the number of independently run um, co-working communities around the world, right? And you know all the stats around this, but mm -hmm. but there were specific mindsets in particular that really led people to kind of go, wow, this is there's something really, really interesting and exciting about this model, about this way of working, about this way of connecting and learning from peers. Mm -hmm. How has the value proposition of co-working changed in the last 10 years in your mind? Yeah. Well, let's just start back 20 years ago for a second, because I think it's important to know that this whole movement of co-working was actually brought on by the laptop and the cell phone. Mm. Right. So let's be really right. practical right. here, right? Like right. it was the emergence of the laptop 
mm-hmm. which allowed people to take work with them. And this little device, you know, was right. able to transform the way that we, how, how we were tied to a place. So, and, and that, that cell phone and the laptop facilitated gig workers, gig economy workers. And, you know, you can say that's a bad thing or a good thing, and that's a different conversation, but the gig economy allowed people to all of a sudden have freedom. Mm. They had a new kind of freedom and it didn't work for everybody. Like it's not for everybody. Some people right. really struggle that, you know, they need to be with a group of people to do the work. Other people who tend to be more mature in their jobs or their work or more professionally advanced, that ability to take your work anywhere became this like phenomenon, this movement around freedom. And so what's interesting is that that sort of sense of I can do anything I want, I can take my work anywhere I want. By 10 years ago, people were really good at it, right? Like they were getting really, really good at it. And they're going, but you know, I still need a place to sit down. The coffee shop owner's looking at me weird. I got to keep going, you know? And, and so what happened was you started to see, um, you started to see that the way that co-working allowed for the collaboration for the community. But in our case, what was really fascinating is that was that time 10 years ago when we still had the startup, right? Mm -hmm. You have to remember there was an incredible sense of optimism around entrepreneurship and in our case, social entrepreneurship, but startups were all the rage. Now that you're starting to see is not happening right now because all sorts of economic reasons. And so different kind of constraints there. But 10 years ago, the idea that you could go in without huge capital costs, bring your team together for two days a week and sit down and be able to build out a business model with all of these different online tools, blah, 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 blah. There was so much enthusiasm. And so a co-working space gave you access to um, one, you didn't have to have a huge startup cost, right? So it used to be when you started a business, you needed to like get an office and sign a lease and it was a five-year lease and da, 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 da. So all of a sudden you got, you know, six months, you can come in for six, try it out on a month to month basis. Then you could also, you needed that community because two things, three things were happening. One, entrepreneurs needed each other to bounce ideas off of. So the need for community and for relationships and like, what do you think about? And I've just tried this and I'm going this direction. Big, big part of what we found was happening. And then, of course, talent. You know, I remember this amazing nonprofit, or I guess it was a for-profit called Wanderer. And it was the this fellow who's, who basically had, he came into CSI and he was in and out of the of our space within like eight months. But what he did is he, he came in, he got a desk, he set up everything, he incorporated everything. He then picked off, I think, like eight different employees from, from amongst the community and then then scaled and grew and, th- and, and we were out, right? He was out. He was passed. He grew out. Right. And the ability for a startup or a small organization to accumulate the assets, the knowledge, the skills, the wisdom, and mm-hmm. the talent to be able to test the viability of their oper- of the business and then either fly or die. Phenomenal. Um, And and so that we just saw, uh, we saw how the very practical um, reduction of costs and reduction of risk and reduction of commitment Hmm. um, in, in startups was a huge part. And that was also true in the nonprofit space, right? It's we didn't have huge uh, barriers to entry. Um, And then they could build. And what we always found is people came for the space they love the idea of not paying for the photocopier and not paying for the right. fax machine. Um, and then, but what they did is they stayed for the community, you know, and I, the number of EDs who are uh, leaders who say, oh yeah, no, I'm never leaving CSI. This is the only stability I have in my life. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> this awesome, you know, right. It's, it was, it's such a, it was such a beautiful, um, it's actually such a beautiful thing. And I think, you know, where we were 10 years ago, it, the the core ingredients are still true today. Right. I remember, you know, back in 2004, writing a, uh, a one page business case on why I should get a laptop to my manager. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
yeah, uh, it's you know th things have things have changed a lot, and so you're, you're absolutely right. I think it, it really, it, you know, fundamentally the the cell phone and the laptop um, did, did it all. So, but we we are standing because you mentioned sort of picking up a, a few things here. Um, we you know it feels like you know collaboration. You know, on one hand, collaboration we have flexibility. You know, and sort of demands and needs around around all of that, and then and then technology, right? It's fundamentally mm -hmm. transformed. Yeah, totally. Everything. But when you look at the the next you know five to ten years, what would you say are the the three big shifts shaping future growth? Because we are at this intersection, it feels like, of collaboration, flexibility, and technology. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, I I mean, off the top, I'm just going to say number one, networking. Right? Mm -hmm. It's really really hard to meet new people and sell products online. It's really hard. So the networking event, I think you've, you know, it's something we could talk about quite a bit, but it's like, it's a really important one um, for people to, and that networking is for talent, it's for sales, it's for, you know, idea generation, it's finding board members. It, it's like, it, there's so many um, reasons that that network. The, the, the second one that I'll just say is that community and loneliness and belonging are so absolutely mm -hmm. central right. to why we go to work. Right. And and it's so funny because I I, th I think a lot about what is work, what is the job, what is a job, and mm. you know I, sometimes I think that CSI is really just a community center. You know, <laughs> it's like it's like right. relationships, and and so you make friends, and you have people that you see, and those loose connections, and when you need a you know to need to sublet your place, or when you know you you know you're looking for feedback on your new idea, like you know right. can do it at lunch, and so there's something um the community piece cannot be overstated especially mm -hmm. at a time when loneliness is at an all-time high so um so I, I mean i think this is and then i just think pure purely just flexibility and autonomy in the soul right like i think what's so exciting about um work from home is that it's um it's just it's part of a it's part of a modular approach to how you live your life, right? I think it's like sometimes you want you sometimes your energy is like I'm really I need to really concentrate and stay focused on my computer. So I'm going to work from home today and get that work done, shut down right. all the things. Some days you're like, oh no, I need like that expansiveness. And so this question of how are we able to respond to our um, embodied selves a little bit more, because I think that's what the pandemic did do, right? It said, oh, guess what? You have a body. Your body, your body needs energy in this in this way that you didn't even know you needed, you were getting it. And when we cut it off from you, something in you died. And mm. that understanding of, uh, of our embodied selves and of our relationships and of our need for those energetic connections is just, it's real. And nobody really has, we don't really have the language around it quite yet, but we all feel it, you know, right. we all feel it. I want to get into loneliness a little bit because there's a there's a lot of you mentioned this uh, a couple of times now and there's lots of research coming out are, are, are on loneliness. But I want to just ask you a direct question: Like, are we are we are we kidding ourselves here? Because like, we're all sitting at home. We all know we all know the stats on loneliness, but we're still home. Like, what? what yeah. Why? What? Why goes on? Yeah, I mean, I think this is really an interesting one. I, I agree with you. Like, why? What? Like, what the hell? What? What? What are we doing here? Um, and it, it's 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 so funny because it's like the inertia to get us out of the house and into the space. You know, like this week, mm. this week I've been I've worked from home three days and I've worked from the office two days, and the two days in the office were like the days where I was like, Oh my God, I met such and such and such and such. And I connected this way. And, and I just came home full of energy. And like, after our session today, I'll have another phone call and, you know, and, and, and I won't feel as good about my day. I know it, but there's this, there is this really interesting um, resistance that we seem to have. And so this is where I actually think leaders really need to do their teams uh, some service. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is to say, like, yeah, no, let's meet in person uh, and not just because your co-working space needs you to. Ha -ha. But more importantly, uh, like, you know, when you get folks to come in, they the 
the smaller connections, the, the more human connections, hearing about each other's personal lives, the, the social capital that gets built is undeniable, right. right? But let's talk about loneliness for a second because I'm studying loneliness in a big, big, big way. It, this, is, this is the core of our misery as a species, right? Like I, I feel, um, we see, we, uh, we know that um, there's really interesting, I'm sure everybody's heard the one, uh, chronic loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, uh, and there was a, another one, I, I forget the, the stat, but it's like the health, the, the, the cost of being lonely, chronically lonely is, is high from a societal perspective, but it also leads to depression. Uh, and it, it, it's, and it's, it's this question of like, what is, what, it, what can we do um, that will help people to build meaningful relationships. And so, and what, and what, so I, I kind of see loneliness and the ancillary is of course belonging, right? So the question that I'm constantly looking at is, well, how does one build belonging? And just because you're in the same workplace doesn't actually mean that you're going to build belonging, right? And I think this is one of the other things like it can help, but the question is how do we actually build meaningful connections and meaningful relationships? And, what is the process of, um, and how do we get to a place where we can actually ask each other for help? Because that to me is the difference between somebody, like to me, that's the, 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 the uh, on the barometer uh, as you're trying to move towards, you know, belonging, it's the act of asking for help mm. and, and feeling a trust that you will get that help. So, you know, they talk about the power of loose connections, right? And we all, we've all heard these kinds of loose connections things. It's great. But I'm not likely to ask my cheesemonger, even though I know his name is Mark and he's great and I adore the guy and he always gives me great cheese. I, uh, you know, I'm not like likely to ask him to look at my resume. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, right. and, and so um, one of the questions, one of the things that we're really experimenting with and trying to evolve at CSI is this process of how do you build um, connection? How do you reduce the friction mm. between people in order to build the trust that would allow you to ask for help? Now, interestingly enough, we have convenienceized. I don't think that's a real word, but we have made everything so convenient in the world with technology right. that we've taken away all the need to actually talk to one another. So imagine you could wake up in your condo, in, which is a box in the sky, and you could have ordered your breakfast from uh, an online delivery system. You'll right. turn on your computer, meet all day long, uh, and order anything else you want, have Uber deliver your food, and then be able to play your online games and never, ever, ever have to leave that box in the sky, right? And so the question is, and, and we've made everything transactional. So you can buy everything, you know, you can pay for the, you can pay for the Uber, you can pay for the delivery, you can pay for somebody to, you know, clean your house while you're out, like you can pay for all these, Fiverr, you've got this, you can, everything can be done with a dollar and an online transaction makes right. life really efficient, but it takes all the fun out of everything. So my mom is now at the point where she's like, I don't go to any shop that has me do self checkout because I refuse because I actually go out so that I can talk to the cashier. <laughs> she's, she's chatty, but it's like that, but she's, that's the only contact I get in a day. So right. I'm, you know, I go to the restaurant, not because I, need that I could totally order in. I go to the restaurant to talk to Cheryl, the waitress. Right. And, mm. and so this is, it's just this interesting question and everybody's sort of, sorry, my, my bigger point here is that yeah. all, almost nowhere else in our lives do we require and lean on people the way that we do with our coworkers. Mm. In fact, our coworkers are oftentimes the people that we spend more time with than even our family members. And, and the question is, what kind of workplaces are we creating? Right. When the boss's approach has been, you know, productivity and, and delivery. And, you know, but you're coming there because, and you're staying at a workplace because there's nice people. 
And you hear this a lot. So how much of your relationships are actually with your coworkers versus friends or family or other? And this is this really interesting question because it's really throwing up the question of what is work for? Right. Right. And, and let's take a look at that within the idea of the basic income and with AI and robotics and the advent of technology, like you and I can go there. I don't know as much as you do, but I could, to me, it's a really interesting question. Like what is a job? What's a job? What do we have jobs for anymore? And is it, because you're creating a meaningful, purposeful value proposition, or is it for money and, and, or is it for belonging? Is it for your social connection? And this is where I think we, you know, understanding like, you know, economic outcomes versus, you know, basic income versus technology. One of the funniest things I read about AI is this, yeah, AI is going to have do all the creative work so that we can take out the garbage, right? Like this is one of my concerns. Is like, <laughs> right? like they're going to get AI is going to get all the fun stuff, and and nobody's going to take out the garbage. Right? So this right. is a, anyway. Right. It's just to say but, this but, is the area I'm playing in. Yeah, yeah. No, this this is super interesting, and there's a couple of things I want to I want to uh, dig dig a deeper into. But you know, I want to talk about networking because that's the first thing that you mentioned, um, and I. I have heard anecdotally from a number of folks that they're from their teams. There used to be, um, you sort of look at, so like, a, you know, you know, the, the before COVID era and the after COVID era, right. And there, there used to be a keen interest in purposeful connections and networking, but that interest in, in networking and learning from your peers is, is, is declining. Like not a whole lot of folks are seem to be interested in that. Like, you know, would you agree with that? Or is, or is this, uh... I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm afraid that people are afraid of each other. Right. I think, I think that the, what is that? what's that? Why is that? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think, I, I just wonder, I think a lot of it has to do with parenting, um, but we can maybe not go back that far, but like, you know, so much of what we're being told by the world is that it's a terrible, scary spot that the world is a terrible, scary place. And then everybody who walks in with a mask, which is reasonable because, you know, they're afraid of this, but like we, the pandemic was um, created a fear, right? right. And, um, and people work from home and they became more insular and uh, more self-sufficient, they think, but they're actually lonely and miserable and technology doesn't help. And so this question of like, how do we get out? How do we... Um, build trust again, build relationship, are, are willing to take a risk on meeting a new person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's stats on it, but I would guess, I mean, I, for, I for sure probably saw an 80% drop in the number of new people I met during the pandemic. Right. Oh yeah. And, and right. even still, like I'm still coming back, you know, I'm, I'm, there's this sort of resistance and, um, myopicness. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with like, there's this hunkering down feeling because we feel that the world is a, is a scary place. And our media tells us it's a scary place every single day. And that's not, that's not actually entirely true, right? I mean, yes, there's a lot of terrible things going on, but we've never seen less poverty in the world ever. At a global scale, we're doing better than ever. We're eliminating right. diseases. We're bringing back species. We're protecting land. Like we're doing amazing, amazing work, uh, solving really long and tractable problems. I mean, there's more freedom on this planet than there's ever been. And yet we don't think about that. We don't think about that. We don't raise our children. And we weren't raised in a context of believing that the world is a fabulous, wonderful place where you can meet new people and engage in new ways. And so the, the networking event, I do think has become, um, you know, well, put it this way, the networking events at CSR are fantastic and on fire. Uh, and that's because people, I think there's also the zeitgeist of people of like a, you know, the good 40% of the people who are like, Oh no, I don't care. I'm desperate. I'm an extrovert. I gotta go. <laughs> you know? And so there's, there is like the, you know, the, the people are like, Oh yeah, no, I'm in. And then there's the people who are like, oh no, I'm I'm back here. Mm. And I think one of the questions is, you know, I think that's why your wellness summit is so important, right? Is 
it has the opportunity to call into question, you know, what is it that makes you happy? And what is it that makes you healthy? And, you know, we know that that Harvard happiness study was yeah. like, we know that it's people that make us happy. It's relationships. Um, but you got to put yourself out there to build those relationships. And, and it's not, it's not people. And this is the really interesting nuance in that study is that it's, it's, it's not people, you know, right. It's those, it's those small interactions with people that you don't really know. It's the, you know, the person that you see at the park or, you know, the, 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 the bus driver or, you know, like those kinds of folks that, and it's, it's just that, that, that smile and those, those micro interactions, you, you know, you mentioned, you know, um, it, it, your, your, your mom going to, you know, restaurants and going, going to buy, it's, 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 those, it's those moments, right? Yeah. It's those moments. And, uh, and, and this is it because for a lot of us, those micro interactions often came at co-working spaces, at offices, et cetera. Right. And now, as you said, <laughs> we, we, the delivery economy has shattered so much of that, right? right. It's shattered every micro interaction you could have. You could order one pencil, one pen. You could order, have it in, you know, at your doorstep in 20 minutes. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. But, but, but that, but that means that you sort of lose out on this, uh, on this, on the beauty that is, that, that is these, these real life, these real life interactions. That's uh, right. You know the the thing that's it's also really interesting though that I'm seeing is you know for those leaders and those managers who said back in 2020 no this is we are we are fully remote our organization is fully remote this is this is this is the strategic choice that we're making and and it is going to be a breakthrough new thing a lot of these folks are now admitting that they may have made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that they thought the solution was as simple as allowing all employees to work from home all the time. Yeah. And, and yes, you know, flexible work can improve well-being. Mm -hmm. They are now hearing, and you mentioned this from their teams, that it's actually, it may have done more harm than good. That's right. Because it wasn't implemented well, wasn't thought through. So what, what, do you, what do you make of this sort of reversal? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think uh, I think many of us knew that it was not a good thing. Um, mm. uh, but I mean, look, let's take the things that are good. Right. You know, typical Toronto and I live in, in, in uh, Toronto, you know, commutes 92 minutes a day. Like, that's crazy. Right. So working right. from home just bought them an hour and a half to do something in service to their community. Right. Like or to their family or to be able to do the dishes and therefore not fight with their spouse. Right. Like that's that's all good stuff. So um, and, you know, look. Uh, when the weather gets bad, I'll tell you, Mondays and Fridays are dead at CSI. So if you're ever looking for office space, like nobody's coming in Mondays and Fridays in the winter, like not a chance. So, you know, we've already, we've actually also bought ourselves the four day work week. I just want you to know that like that actually happened. Um, uh, but, but uh, yeah, so it's by virtue. Um, but I think what's, what's the opportunity here is for leaders to become more intentional about how they're harnessing this, this um, evolving flow around work, right? Mm. So, you know, one of the questions is how are we bringing more purpose and clarity to the work of somebody who is working from home so that they really are not losing momentum and that they still have some energy and uh, right. pro pro propelling this uh, going forward. But also then where, when are we bringing everybody together? And so it's interesting because one of the things that has shifted at CSI is you know, where people were once buying, you know, permanent offices, they're now downgrading their offering, but our events and meeting room rentals has gone up hmm. because they're doing way more team meetings, right? So it's a, right. it's a natural kind of thing. You see the team meeting becoming a whole day thing and it's happening way more regularly, right? Right. So that's good. I think that's a good thing. And, and so the question is when you're coming together, are you just sitting down and staring at your computers or are you actually doing the work of engaging with one another and taking that work and those relationships to the next level? And so that's where I see really exciting things happening where you can leverage the power of a co-working space 
Um, and, and ultimately, yeah, sure, you can have some seats for people who would prefer to work from home. I mean, anybody with kids pretty much loves to come to the office, right? Like it's, right. <laughs> yeah, it was originally, it was like, oh, I can't, I'm so happy to be home with my kids. Now it's like, oh, I'm so happy to be away from my kids. Like I can't wait uh, to go to the office. So that's a, that's I'm a, that <laughs> <laughs> I recognize that. Even I'm just like, no, I gotta yeah. go. Yeah. Um, so it, uh, but I think this question of like, how are we spending our time together? Hmm. Wow, what a great question. Uh, it's not just showing up at the office and letting it happen. But I mean, the, you know, at CSI- but Showing up can't be another Zoom call type thing, just in person, right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And so how are we actually animating our relationship? How are we fostering those connections? How are we doing the kind of collaborative work or culture building or relational work when we're together? And so to my mind, you know, getting- um, so, you know, at CSI, one of the things that we've seen is because we do our, our rituals. So on a weekly basis, CSI hosts a salad club and we host our, uh, right. you know, get the scoop or our coffee chats. And what's been interesting is watching our members. They kind of we we assume the fun part of their work and then they have their team meeting associated so they can all meet at salad club, too. Right. So it's just funny how they're like. The busiest days for team meetings tend to, tend to be the same days that we're doing these rituals. So they get a, a piece of networking, a piece right. of collaboration, and a piece of you know social capital building. And I, you know, my my mantra with our team has been something my dad taught me years ago, which is there got to be three reasons to do something. Law of efficiency, right? Got to be three reasons. So pick up your mail, you know, connect with your team, and uh, and then have a good meeting, and then like salad club. Right. So this uh, allows you to kind of outsource the fun building and still get the work done. And you get to do a little bit of the networking relationship building and, and uh, camaraderie. And if you can do that two days a week, um, most of the studies are saying, uh, well, the last one I read was you need 1.4 days in order to get the greatest benefit from the collaborative benefit from team working, hmm. some from team building. So 1.4 right. days per week is apparently the magic amount that your team should be together. So throw in two days a week and you're probably good to go. Right. Um, this makes me think of, I don't know why, but uh, you know, not not trying to sort of um, um, re-articulate your, <laughs> your, your business model here, but a oh, lot of what we talked about, social capital building, rituals, et cetera, it, it makes me think about the hospitality world. And it makes me think about hospitality. You know, you mentioned well-being, ritual, social capital building, networking. So like hospitality is all about hosting and curating experiences and curating um, a uh, uh, flow and, uh, and, and and your time somewhere, right? And so, and, and I really wonder about um, what, 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 what if, what if, hospitality were a new framing for, for this, for this industry. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I, I, impact hub, which you're a part of is I had some great language around it. I think they, um, mm. you know, they call it, they call it hosting, right? The art, the art of hosting. Um, and, you know, we, we often talk about radical hospitality at CSI, right? Like what mm. does it look like to radically invite, to radically right. host? Um, so yeah, a hundred percent. And in fact, I think you're touching on something that we're, looking at much more um, actively uh, in terms of planning. And if, if people out there have ideas on this, I'd love more research because I'm just starting to get my head around it. But, you know, you know, the promise of CSI and the impact hubs and any of these sort of co-working spaces, hypothetically, especially, you know, CSI and the impact hubs was like, you know, we're, we're uh, the, the theory of change is you create the space, you animate the community, and you create the conditions for social innovation emergence. Okay. But you said the word magic word curating, right? And, and then I want to talk about the word innovation, because that's where I've been kind of playing around with this new idea that I'm playing with called, that I'm calling um, purpose by proximity. So mm. it turns out in the research that it's not good enough to actually be in the same, like organized, like CSI across multiple locations. Actually, the greatest impact you can have in terms of innovation is if you're within 50 feet, 50 feet of a prospective collaborator. 
So one of the things that I've been contemplating and we're starting to look at is this idea of actually starting to cluster. Once we only have one building, start to cluster member organizations by SDG in a physical space. So right. it's, it's kind of cool, right? So I'm I'm kind of like, okay, so the, the hard part is we have to sell a building. The good news is we have like this building and we can become more intentional about who we're curating into this proximity-based cluster. Hmm. And with the goal of really starting to become more um, intentional about how we're fostering the deeper collaborations that are possible amongst our members. So, you know, this is where there's always an upside, Vinod. <laughs> there's always, there's always a, you know, yeah, right, yeah. And, it, and you know, I feel, it feels so funny because I'm like, I've been at this for 20 years, nearly next year, I'll be 20 years. And, and um, like, I've known that all the time, but like maybe at year 20, I'll finally be able to do it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> next year is 20 that is that is a milestone isn't that crazy that's it, right yeah. yeah yeah it's um i you know we were the first co-working space in canada and right. um and when we and when we did this and i don't know if i i'm it's hilarious but like literally we work stole our website verbatim they just took out the word social innovation eh? like it's so funny but they did a much better job at scaling let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> And falling. <laughs> and falling and falling. But, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they, you know, how they uh, right. reinvent themselves. But, yeah, 20 years. And, and I, you know, it's so funny because it's been a lot of trial and error, you know, mm. trying new things, figuring out new things. And, you know, I, I feel very grateful um, that we were like a lot of it was it wasn't so much the the you know, the, the purpose wasn't about the square footage necessarily, right? Like the, yeah. the, the, this is it, right? And so um, there was a there was a deeper, there was a deeper sense of purpose, uh, yeah. a deeper sense of mission. And and so co-working has never ever shown up in our mission statement. Right. Never once. Because that's never been the goal. Our our mission is to catalyze, inspire, and support social innovation. And it always has been. And you know, co-working was a tactic. And, and and so now, actually, the real estate assets were also just a tactic. It was never like we thought, oh, we should get into, you know, you know land or, or, or land trust. I mean, a CSI is a commercial land trust. Um, but we always saw it as a means to an end because we believe so much in the power of those connections and collaborations that would emerge out of the spaces that we are creating. Right. And so in some ways, you know, I'm an Ashoka fellow and um, it, it, Bill Drayton says that or somebody, maybe it was somebody who studied him, said, you know, a social entrepreneur peaks at 25 years. <laughs> like the, the typical entrepreneur peaks at five years. Right. But the but the social entrepreneur peaks at 25 years. So I figure I got five more years. I'm five more years. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Totally. Let's see what I can finally figure out what the hell I'm doing, you know. Um, <laughs> so. The um, I am really intrigued by your framing of purpose by proximity, and yeah. um, I'm, I'm really excited to see how this um, how this comes together yeah. in the context of the SDGs. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I believe in the in the in the proximity thesis. I, I mm -hmm. strongly believe in it, and I. I I think some of the some of the best ideas that I that that I've had um, come from that 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 proximity, mm -hmm. and um, and and it could have been you know in a networking event, it could have been you know um, co working, it could have been at a conference, but but the the, the proximity is there, yeah. and you know like I'm yeah, you know, but but I'm also at the same time like there, there is this there is this um, there's this tension in me because uh, you know. I think back to how much I traveled before the pandemic and how much I'm traveling now mm. and the, you know, become incredibly picky and, and I, I frame it in terms of productivity, you know, which may not be the right framing. And, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on productivity because lots of folks are, you know, there's, 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 a, there's, there's, there are camps now, you know, where mm -hmm. folks have said, you know, Productivity uh, goes up when you have real human connections. 
and uh, and it sort of flatlines, you know, if, if you don't interact with humans in real life for a prolonged period of time. Mm -hmm. it, nice. it used to be an important work performance measure. I am not even sure if it's still useful as a measure, mm -hmm. but, you know, you're, you know, you brought this up, um, you know, at, at the very start of the conversation, but what's, what's productivity today? Like, you know, it's, it's not, you know, like we, we're, we're past the sort of the punching in and out stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. some folks are still doing that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and that stuff's got to change, but that well, let's set that set that aside for now. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, for the knowledge workers in us, the laptop and cell phone folks, mm -hmm. punching in and out, that we're past that. But mm -hmm. how how would you characterize productivity today? You know, it's a great question. I don't know that I I don't know that I know. I don't know that I know much about productivity, right? Like I think one of the things that I think is in crisis is, you know, it, it comes back to this, what is a job, right? For a long, long time, we hired people to do a certain number of hours, right? Right. And some people still choose- And contract in many ways are structured that way. Right? That, that's right. And, and and so the hourly worker is, is like right. an interesting um, thing. But then now what we have is we have the expert, right? We have the people who can achieve something. So for example, you know, uh, if you asked me, uh, Tanya, can you build a community animation strategy for my organization? You know, it's taken me 20 years to be able to answer that question in probably about half a day. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, you know, is it, are you paying, would you pay for me hourly or for that expertise? And, and so mm -hmm. this other, this other question, but then I think that the core here is that um, there's a, the real challenge here is the business model. Um, and this is where I think we are in complete disarray as a society, mm. um, where, uh, you know, this intersection between technology and a job and well-being and, you know, uh, is it's it's. I basically, you know, you you probably know I was working on a whole, uh, you know, a whole huge rebrand of CSI to go to be building the next economy before the pandemic hit. It's right. like the next economy conversation, the next economy. And then I laugh now because it's like, oh, yeah. And then the next economy happened to us. <laughs> right. So so like you got to be a little more specific, Tanya. <laughs> you know, what kind of economy do you actually want? And. And it's this interesting question of every single business model in the world right now is up for discussion, mm. up for debate, right? Like even just look at what you've been able to do with Future of Good. Right. You know, 10 years ago, the idea of a subscription-based magazine journalism was unheard of, right? Like we didn't, we, we, weren't, we weren't there. Um, that is a whole new business model for, for, has its own unique challenges. I mean, commercial real estate, like what the heck are all those commercial real estate owners going to do with all of that space? Are people right. coming back to the office? And the answer is no. No, they're not. But now everybody's a co-working space. You can have a co-working space at the bottom of your condo. You can have a co-working space at the, you know, in the mall. Everybody's a co-working So we don't need to be a co-working space, right? Mm -hmm. We happen to have co-working as one of the many things that CSI has always done. But really the core for us is community and connection. So, so the question though about productivity, what is what is productivity when you have AI? What is productivity uh, when we might have a basic income? Should we have a basic income? What and, and where would people, if we didn't work for a living, so much of our identity is tied up in the act of creating a, a value proposition in our work, especially on our little laptops there. And so it, I think we're in this really interesting crisis of like, what the heck goes into a life? And I'm going to make it even more complicated. We also have a deficit of spirituality in our lives. So we, for most of our generations as a species, have had some belief in some spiritual meaning. And the further back you go, the more interesting, I think. <laughs> but we've seen the decline of spirituality in our lives. You know, we've become so intellectual, so up here that we've forgotten about the need for um, spirituality to create wellness. 
And so to me, just a further comment, I mean, I know you asked me about productivity and now I'm talking about spirituality, but there you go. Is like, um, is like, you know, until we are satiated in our lives, we're going to be obsessed with bigger is better thinking and productivity and the job are metrics that don't get at the core human dilemma. So take the job, take a basic income, take AI, take productivity, take the, 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 the all the things, you know, nine to five working five days a week that all of this, this framework. And we're, we're basically saying, oh, none of this is working for us anymore. Like it's, it's all a mixed bag and the business model, what do we do? Like, do we have the business models to support this many people doing things that are proactive or do we need a really fundamental rethink so that we're asking ourselves, not how do I get rich or bigger, faster, more, but right. how do we get well, whole and satiated? And so I think we're at this amazing moment in time where the industrial paradigm is collapsing, Vinod. And what's happening is we're really questioning what we're working so hard for. So what is the goal? How do we define success? You know, I, I, I'll just say, as somebody who has watched the WeWork story and watched Adam Newman walk off with a giant settlement to exit when he actually failed, Compared to my little nonprofit salary that, you know, I always worry about in my own little life. It's like, I'm satiated at, I don't, I don't need, you can't take it with you. You know, the money, you can't take it with you. So this bigger is better thinking mm -hmm. is something that we're questioning the question of scale. Now we have to talk about degrowth, right? And so what, what is the human um, what is our capacity as a human? How do we become satiated so we can actually focus on what's important? And to me, it's about how we bring spirituality back into the conversation and really look at how we are able to heal our souls so that we don't need to have everything on demand, but rather we can go, hey, I'm going to go for a walk and ask Mark for some gray owl cheese. Right. <laughs> Um, I, I've, I've, I've got to meet Mark now. Um, <laughs> That's a nice guy. Right. Um, I don't even know his last name. <laughs> um, but, but I want to connect it to the, to, to, to work though, because what is the, like, what's the place? Of, like, like I, I, you know, like, like, it sounds like, you know, spirituality has a place at work. But what is it? Yeah. Well, I mean, so I, I would say work is about community. It's about relationships. And, and the bosses, that's often me, you know, thinks it should be about productivity. But actually, workplaces are about community and belonging, if done well. They're also about uh, uh, workplace harassment and, 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 and negative toxic cultures, if done poorly. And, and and so you know, there's two sides to everything there. But I think one of the questions is: Are we are we creating these organizations? Um, you know, what what are the motivations? There's the product and the process, right? Mm -hmm. The product is the goal, the mission. You know, in the nonprofit sector, we're blessed because we have missions that are actually quite uh, needs based most times, and and loving and caring and and wellness based. Right. But in the for-profit sector, we, you know, there may be just like, to sell more shoes, right? Like, you know, who cares? But what actually the reason, you know, these organizations have come to be is they're actually the embodiment of how we organize as a species and the opportunity to create a sense of belonging and a sense of community and a sense of satiation, spiritual satiation is there. We, we have those kinds of, it's possible for us to use this organizing platform to become more whole. Um, but I don't think that that's how leaders and, and business operators and, and um, I don't think we've kind of wrapped our head around what that means yet. And I also don't know that it's necessarily should necessarily land with the employer because like, let's be clear, the expectations hmm. on the employer are already crazy high and they're not actually qualified to guide anybody's spiritual growth. So let me be really clear. <laughs> I'm not, I am in no way qualified nor do I think that they would be, but I think we are able to build belonging 
And that belonging can increase productivity, can decrease conflict. It can increase joy and purpose and belonging if we're thoughtful about it. And and then I think us as a society sort of saying, hey, what, what satiates us? What brings us joy? Is it just being outside of nature? Right. Like for me, that's my spirituality is, is getting outside, you know, but right. Um, everybody's different. Um, yeah. I, I, you, you hit on a really interesting um, point for me, which is expectations on, on, on employers. And mm. um, I, 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 I want to sort of just, I want to, I want to go deeper on that because like <laughs> the expectations, <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I could speak from, from from my personal perspective, but also what, what I'm hearing, you know, from from across the social purpose world, uh, and and you know beyond, is that the expectations on an employer have just like yeah. kind of, poof, like just yeah. exponentially grown, right? Like, right. you know, I need you to be my my activist. I need you to take stances and and, and take certain postures on things that matter to the world. I need you to you know be my my personal coach, you know, help me in my professional development. I need you to take care of my pet. I need you to take, you know, take care of me while I'm sick. I need you to like all of this stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> but, and, and, and so what, you know, the, and I think this is a deficit this is a result of not having the kinds of strong relationships that we used to, or having the church or the kind of community relationships. And so we we're putting it on the employer. And I think it's a really interesting question. Like, you know, how exactly am I qualified as an employer to decide whether that was sexual harassment or not? Right? Like what qualifies me as the boss to, to actually know what the hell, you know, I, how do I make that decision? Like that, that's a different function. I'm not a therapist. That's not the job that I was hired for. Like, you know, we entrepreneurs, we, we get in, we create stuff. We, we might have, we might may have expertise in the area that we're trying to achieve, but we very likely don't have expertise to actually support, you know, 80, 100 people with their therapy, their childcare, their their sexual harassment claims or, you know, concerns about such and such or comfort resolution over here. Like we're not actually. And so what's happened is there's a bit of a pile on like the only avenue to get at humans now is through the employer because we don't have these other vehicles to reach people at that level. So we're piling on to the employer, expecting the employer to somehow solve it all in the name of, you know, productivity and workplace harmony and good, healthy culture, maybe. And that, and, you know, and we're doing it, uh, many of us, but to better and worse degrees, you know? And so this is, it's just an interesting question of what's happened. Who's in charge of that? And how do we make decisions uh, that are going to be best for everybody? And, you know, anyway, it, it's a really, even not all I'm just really saying is it's a bit complicated right now. Right. <laughs> Well, well, this is it. We're 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 in between eras, right? We're in between yeah. eras. Whether we're talking economic systems or or the you know the, the purpose of a job and where we fit in our own sort of you know neighborhoods and communities and and how we belong and connect to one another, all of this is is transitioning. Yeah. And um and uh and and that's and that's the sort of the big question is, is what does it look like, you yeah. know, to go through this transition and 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 be supported in it. And, and and so let's talk about that for a little bit, because I think we may not know where we're going or how we're going to get there, but I think we can decide what, what are some values that are important for us to bring forward into the future. Mm. And, and um, you know, off the top of my head, you know, we've mentioned a few already, like the ability to smile at somebody new, but that's it. Like, just try it. <laughs> you know, I think you'll find that the act of just kind of like, you know, making eye contact with someone, doing something uh, kind or generous for somebody else, just with no expectation of return, like just to open up that human connection. Um, so, you know, for me, this is like such an important one to have the confidence. Mm. to be able to make eye contact and to start a conversation. And, and 90% of the time, the conversation will go nowhere. And that's okay. Because, 
you know, what I've found, even on the streets, you know, what, certainly at CSI in your co-working space or in your community, just, you know, a little bit of a reach out. If you can do a little bit of a reach out, it's amazing how that can spiral, you know, and support in a really positive way, a connection. And then you see that person again, or you don't, or you see them again and again and again. And next thing you know, you are going for coffee. Right. And like, this is what the human spirit is craving. Um, and, and it's, but it's really, I think the invitation is to, for each of us once a day to smile at somebody that we didn't expect to smile at. That's it. And, and, and then to be able to remain agile. And, you know, as I was watching my entire kind of co-working empire collapse in front of my eyes, I was thinking with work from home, I was thinking to myself, self, this is exactly what you wanted the end of the industrial paradigm around work. So there it crumbles down. So it's like, okay, what's the, what is the, um, in this messy phase right now? And it is, it's really messy. This is actually, we'll talk about this time as the time where great innovations happened, right? Mm -hmm. New business models are emerging. New agreements are emerging. New understandings of what we can expect from government or from the employer and are starting to emerge. So in some ways, we're in the middle, you know, we talk in social innovation about the first horizon, first, second, and third horizons, right? We've right. been in this first horizon. We're trying to get to the third horizon and we're in this messy, messy middle, but that messy middle second stuff is a place of creativity and innovation. And so I, to me, that's an exciting place that we get to bring. And the invitation I offer is like, invite, bring your whole self into that place. Like, What's the world we actually want to live in? How do we start co-creating the environments and the communities that are the ones that will allow us to thrive? Um, and so I think that there's a huge amount of space, you know, as we're rethinking housing, as we're rethinking urbanization, as we're rethinking work, as we're rethinking spirituality, as we're rethinking business models and technology. This is, this is the moment. Um, and stay as positive as you can. Like, don't watch too much news. <laughs> and and you remember that when we're when we when we go out to create new things in the world to bring joy mm -hmm. and kindness, and those values are the things that are going to create the kinds of outcomes that will sustain us for years to come. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it there because that was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, Tanya, thank you so, so much for your time, your energy, your insights, perspectives, and and really the wealth of nuance you bring to these complex questions on the future of work. Um, we spoke uh, a bit about workplace well-being here, um, but um, I just want to sort of mention to folks who are listening and tuning in, if your team is keen to advance workplace well-being, um, there are still early bird access um, uh, tickets open for Canada's first ever Changemaker Wellbeing Summits taking place March 21, 22, sorry, March 20th and 21st, uh, 2024. And I would love to see your see your team there. So thank you so much again, Tanya, for for joining us so much to, uh, to listen back into. And, uh, and, and I will be doing that. Um, thanks, folks, again for for tuning in. See you next time on Future of Bit Life. Thanks, Vinod.